1942, a big bomb was a 10-ton blockbuster. Make pretty good mess. It took a B-29 to carry it, but uh, that's exploding a lot of dynamite, if you will. Three years later, first atom bomb, about 16,000 tons of TNT energy release equivalent. That was in 45. Seven years after that, the first H-bomb, Mike, it was called, a three-mile-wide fireball. This was a nuclear fusion device. And it released the energy of 10 million tons of TNT. So from 10 tons to 16,000 to 10 million tons in 10 years. This is the real world we're living in. This isn't theoretical, you know, wouldn't it be nice if we could, but we can't, so we won't kind of stuff. And so every aspect of the whole business of propulsion has been misrepresented by the ancient academics and fossilized physicists. Uh, I give an example uh, in, well, and science was wrong as well, of a guy who calculated, the, uh, an astronomer, Dr. Campbell, 1941, published a paper calculating the required initial launch weight of a rocket able to get a man to the moon and back. There was a lot of science fiction being written about going to the moon, and he was saying, ha, that's ridiculous. So he published a paper in which he calculated that weight the weight at launch would have to be, he said, a million, million tons. And he was a little off. The right answer is 3,000 tons. He was off a factor of 300 million. <laughs> now, that's making a mistake, a lot of mistakes. <laughs> he made all the wrong assumptions because he hadn't studied any of the literature. Uh, for example, he assumed a single-stage rocket, he assumed too low an exhaust velocity, too low an acceleration, assumed that you'd have to use a retro rocket to slow down when you came back instead of using the atmosphere. He assumed that the rocket would have to provide all the energy. I thought that was very interesting in the book Flying Saucers in Science about how a rocket could navigate space much more effectively in terms of energy usage. It's truly incredible. Well, that's what happens when you get a bunch of good engineers whose focus is not on publishing but on solving a problem. Can you share a piece from that? Because I think that the audience would find it very interesting to hear how it could be done much more fuel efficiently. Well, he assumed a single-stage rocket, for example. That means you've got to keep accelerating the can in which the first batch of fuel was carried. Why not throw away the can? Then you don't need to accelerate it. He assumed that you used much too low an acceleration, 1G. Astronauts routinely take 5 Gs. A trained pilot can take uh, 14 Gs for two minutes. That's 300 miles an hour per second. You know, at, at uh, 1 G, you get to 63 miles an hour in three seconds. That's a pretty hot car, incidentally. <laughs> uh, he forgot the fact that uh, the atmosphere will slow you down when you come back. You've got to be smart. That is, hit the, the uh, atmosphere at the right angle. Remember Apollo 13? Yes. <laughs> If the angle isn't right, you're in deep trouble. Either you make a big hole in the ground or you leave the Earth forever. Uh, so being smart's important. And we use the gravitational field of the moon. We don't need to put any energy into the pot. You'd be in the right place at the right time, and it'll pull you. That's what gravity's all about. And so we use uh, cosmic freeloading on all our deep space probes. And if you don't, you're not going to be able to do them. The weight goes up enormously greater. And so, well, as an example, on the Apollo program, originally the plan required two Saturn V launches, uh, Earth orbit rendezvous. Instead, we had lunar orbit rendezvous, and it could be done with one. Uh, somebody convinced Werner von Braun, let's, I, I've done the calculations, let's look at them. Looks good to me, and there are a lot of advantages in having only one launch. I mean, launch pads and weather and all kinds of things uh, that can go wrong that you can avoid if you only have one. Uh, so smart engineers figuring out solutions to problems uh, are the way you get things done. Uh, well, a typical one, how many people have noticed that the astronauts always go up on their backs? There's a reason for that. You can stand far more acceleration back to front than foot to head. Knees and hips don't like a lot of acceleration. Uh, and so it, it's being clever when you say, my goal is to get the job done, not 
how to figure out how it can't be done. And many of the early uh, articles that deal with travel to the stars have made all the wrong assumptions. Uh, well, for example, why one a Nobel Prize winning physicist, he said, well, let's see, you're going to accelerate at 1G for halfway out. Let's say you want to go to a place 12 light years away. And then you'll turn around and decelerate at 1G. Well, how utterly absurd a mission profile. At, as I mentioned earlier, at 1G, at the end of a year, you're going to close to the speed of light. Why would you keep accelerating? Uh, it's like a 747 doesn't keep accelerating. It gets to cruise speed, and it cruises. Same in your car. You're not jamming on the gas so that you can go faster and faster and faster. It's silly. And the choices you make, in other words, have uh, implications. And so it's a good thing we have engineers solving these problems instead of uh, professors. Uh, because the professors don't have the right experience to get the job done. And this is in many different areas. It's not just, uh, you know, flight to the stars. Also, why is it that people want to talk? I've had a noted uh, astrophysicist professor uh, talk about, well, I used to think, wouldn't it be great to go to Andromeda, but you know, take way too much energy. Andromeda is another galaxy that's over 2 million light years away. Why would one worry about that when within, oh, say, 55 light years of here, there's a couple of thousand stars? Uh, you know, there's a big difference. If my wife wants a loaf of bread for dinner, I don't say, well, uh, there's a great bakery in Sydney, Australia. I'll go down there. I'll be back next week. <laughs> She says, the supermarket's a mile away. We need it for dinner, not for next week. That's a good analogy. I like that. We live in a real world. Yeah, it's kind of kooky. But a lot of this conversation fills the talk about the issue of getting there from here. And my question to you is, do you think that knowing the smart engineers and the people that are working on this now, not necessarily when you did, but now, do you think that there's a whole new technology for getting, let's say, to Zeta-1 or Zeta-2 reticuli or a place closer? Do they have to use typical fuel? Or is something being well, used that's nuclear different? nuclear fusion is not typical fuel. You use deuterium and helium-3, two very light uh, isotopes of hydrogen and helium, which just happen to be the two most abundant substances in the universe, which is kind of handy if you're going someplace. I think we will work out fusion. And also, we need to subdivide the problem into two parts. Uh, people say, how could an alien spacecraft come here from someplace else and crash in the New Mexico desert? Nobody said it did. Uh, the analogy I use, we have these huge nuclear-powered aircraft carriers. They carry 75 little airplanes, which are not nuclear-powered. And the airplanes are great in the air, lousy on the water, and the, <laughs> the aircraft carrier certainly doesn't fly. Uh, it's it's a two-part system. It's a very different environment between the stars than it is in the atmosphere of a planet. So uh, the question of between the stars, nuclear fusion would do it. Uh, I mean, when you can kick particles out the back end of a rocket that have 10 million times as much energy per particle as they can get in a dumb old chemical rocket, uh, it's a whole different world, in other words. Do I think there's something beyond that? Of course. Because technological progress almost invariably comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. The future is not an extrapolation of the past. A laser isn't just a better light bulb. Entirely different physics. The fission and fusion rockets are not just better chemical rockets. Entirely different physics. Do I think we know what the ultimate is? Of course not. We only discovered the neutron in 1932. There have been neutrons long before that, I'll guarantee you. you know? So uh, one that I have suggested to people, and don't ask me to design a system. I mean, if you can't design it, there can't be. Well, that's ridiculous. But uh, we think that uh, particles are made up of even smaller particles. And when we learn how to release those, uh, we can take advantage of one of the strangest aspects of Mother Nature. Intuitively crazy. When you go from the large atom to the small nucleus, you go down in size by a factor of 
thousands of times. 